Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. Um, this channel is all about worm composting and the many different kinds of worm bins that I have. And today we're going to take a look in on blue. It's been a month since we've been in here and uh, the top of the bin has totally dried out which means we have a really good opportunity to do some sifting here because we know that there is no worms in this dry of an environment. So let me get my sieve and then we can see if we can harvest some of the castings off the top of the bin. Let's take a little lid here and this is my quarter inch screen that I use and then whatever's left over I will just uh, put off to the side and it can go in with the new feeding for today and you can see this dried out too fast or too completely or something because it's big hard chunks which is why you don't want to uh, to dry things out fast with a fan or anything because it dries so fast that it can't get to that nice crumbly texture that's usable in your um, garden. I mean you can use this but most likely you'll end up with a bunch of seeds that are going to germinate that you don't want in your garden. So blue here is a 55 gallon barrel that was split lengthways and put together. I can at the end of the video put a link to uh, how we made this. Not getting a very good uh, recovery on this top part, but that's okay. We'll get some water back in it and uh, it can go back in the other end. So what we affectionately call blue here is being run via the wedge method, which starts at this end and then we progressively add more and more food and then this and over here gets older and gets more finished. Now sometimes what I do is if I have a bin that needs to dry out or or something like that that's almost finished I'll actually put it on top of blue because there's more surface area which is what I've done here because I had a bin that was super wet and uh, sometimes when you let castings get overly done the stickiness of the worm castings actually makes these hard rocks here which is one of the reasons why you don't want to let it go too far. If it's 100% castings then they really do, they get very very sticky when they're wet but when they get dry they also turn into rocks because of that whatever component it is that makes them sticky. It's kind of like hardened glue. That's the best I can come up with a analogy for it. But one of the good things is if you do let your castings get too dry, you can rehydrate them and the cocoons as well as the good bacteria will come back to life over time. So although, you know, you really do try and avoid letting them get too dry, um, when it does happen it is fixable. In a really deep bin like this, you're going to see as I finally get the top of this skimmed off, you are going to see that the worms, there's not very many worms at this end, but the worms that are there had the opportunity to move down this way to where it was more wet, and not only that, uh, they can go deeper because it is about a foot deep. So for this wedge system, I do kind of treat it like a continuous flow in that I take off things from the top. I take off handfuls from the top system, and then anything that's incomplete, like wrappers of uh, you know potato skins or whatever, you know they can go back in and get done again. But again, if you don't have the patience to let it get into you know super fine castings like this, that's fine. I know a lot of people that will let it be um, at the chunky state and just use it like this. Your plants will love it either way. Some people are sifters, some people are not. And either way is totally fine. Um, it just depends on what fits your lifestyle. I have a worm composting YouTube channel. So, um, you know, I do try and make sure that I show people how I do it. You know, this is kind of a, uh, 
not really so much of a this is the expert way of doing things so much as this is how one person's view of how they are successful is and depending upon where you live there are many ways to be successful that's probably one of the things that new worm farmers have the hardest uh, you know time with is realizing that worms don't come with a you know how-to manual it's not a toaster and you can't say 100% that what I do is going to work for you. I can show you what sort of situation that my house is and my bins are and what kind of worms I have. And I can show you what works for me. But when it comes right down to it, honestly, it's experience. And, you know, you win some, you lose some. So as we're getting deeper, you can see how much more moisture there is in the castings that were just, you know, a half an inch below the surface. So the worms and the castings and everything, they can be recharged. That is one of the things that, you know, worm cocoons in perfect conditions usually will, um, according to the books that I've read, they'll hatch, you know, anywhere between 20 days and two months. But in the event that they're not in the best, you know, living conditions, they can actually go dormant for like a year. And not the species that I have, but some species can go dormant for more than one year. The species that are in this bin are red wigglers, blue worms, and European night crawlers. And it is, um, a 55 gallon bin that's about a foot deep. I can put the rest of the measurements in there, I don't remember them off the top of my head. But there's a lot of surface area here and there's a lot of depth. So it does buffer any problems that I might have with the change of the seasons or like in my case I went on vacation and ended up staying for more than a week longer than I planned. The worms have more than enough area to move to some place where there's food or moisture that's you know better for them. And since my basement is basically dedicated just to the worms, um, I don't really have a limit to how many bins I can have or start. So, you know, when I end up with a whole bunch of this, and I'm going to end up with an entire mortar tray of this by the time I'm done, um, I can just put more moisture in that and let the, let the worms that are in the cocoons and everything and the baby worms, let them, you know, work over it again. It takes about six months from the first time you put any sort of food in this bin to, to get a good harvest. If you go uh, less amount of time, like three months, you can get a little bit of a harvest, but you will have a lot more of these leftovers. So it just depends. Are you willing to have leftovers and start over again uh, with this you know, batch, or do you want to let the worms go longer and finish it more? Um, I vote for my particular way of doing it is I harvest quicker and uh, get more castings and then just put things back in to be done again. But either way, you want to do it is fine for you. It also depends on what you feed your worms. If you feed them pureed food all the time or worm chow all the time, there's not going to be all these chunks. And so you won't have to go through the sifting phase like I do. So if you just feed them all pureed food, then there really won't be any leftovers. Um, so this is pretty good. I'm going to go put this in with my castings. Alright, then I will switch over here. But you can see this is really, really, really dry and this will have to go through again. I'm probably getting about 50% of the, uh, the castings out. There's not not enough of the good ones to make this a really good harvest, but that's fine with me. They can go back. I 
Now I did put this blanket on top here to keep everything nice and moist while I was gone on vacation because this is the feeding end of the wedge. The end I've been working on right over here is the part that's been in process for six months to a year. Okay, let's peek under the blanket and see what we've got. Well, the good news is, is that it stayed nice and damp. We won't be harvesting any of this because it is in fact too damp to uh, do any sort of harvest with. Alright, so let me move over these last castings and then we'll do a, a good deep uh, inspection of the whole bin. So, like I said before, this end of the bin is the oldest. The stuff on this end of the bin has been going for six months to a year. And as things get harvested and are compacted, I pile them up higher. So, if you see what I'm doing now is I'm going all the way down to the bottom to make sure that the moisture stays homogenous. I'm wanting this part to dry out. And of course, if it's at the bottom of a pile, it's, you know, the part in the bottom is not going to be um, exposed to air, so it won't be able to dry out. There's not very many worms at this end. You know, the whole theory behind this kind of system is that basically the worms will continue to move as the food moves. So because there's no new food on this end, the worms slowly depopulate this finished portion. Uh, but there are still some worms that hang out in here for whatever reason, and I, I have no idea why. I, maybe there's some food left. But uh, they do. They, there's some worms. You can see a handful of worms here and there as I'm digging that have not vacated this area. But this part has not been fed in many, many months. And so, to me, it seems like, why would you stay there? But, you know, like I always say, worms do what they want. Maybe there's a tiny little bit of uh, food left in this. Or maybe these are worms from cocoons that were left behind. Not sure. Put your thoughts below. Why do I always have worms even in the area that hasn't been fed, you know, for six months? I think it's probably a mixture of there might be, you know, just a little bit of food in here. And also the cocoons hatch. And little worms, you know, have little mouths. And so I guess they don't need the same size food or amount of food. I don't know. I'm rambling. Which I tend to do as I'm going through and, and some people call this fluffing. But you can see that this part down here is very mucky. And it's important that I get that churned up and put on top so that it can dry evenly. Some people don't agree with my fluffing of the bin like this, but not too many people have a bin that holds this much castings. So my environment in here is much different than what most people have. And for my environment that is uh, very uh, humid in the summertime and very dry in the winter, especially in the summertime, it's very necessary for me to get in here and uh, churn this bottom part up or otherwise it will get anaerobic and the, um, the gases from that are harmful to the worms. I put a link below to the books that I've read that discuss some of the worm farming habits. Um, if you want to read, you know, on your own. If you buy them off of Amazon with my link, I do get a little bit of a commission. If I'm not mistaken, it's about 4%. So, not very much, but I like to, you know, give a nod to the authors that write the books that have inspired me to some of my practices. Some of the stuff I have just figured out on my own what works in my environment. But a lot of the information is, is pretty universal as far as like the species and what temperatures are good for them. Like for these worms here, this is their good time of the year. They enjoy the summertime. Basically, you know, it is 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the basement here and the blue worms and the red wigglers and the European night crawlers are absolutely thrilled at this temperature and they do go through a lot of food 
in this temperature. Now if it gets colder, the blue worms in particular do slow down quite a bit. Now you can see the difference. This part that I'm getting into right now is much less finished than that I was just going through. You can still see the speckles of the eggshell. You can still see the paleness of the bedding. Um, I can also leave a link to the kind of bedding that I make. I call it prepared bedding because I generally will make up a batch and have it sit for a couple weeks or, or longer so that it can start to decay a little bit so the worms can eat it faster. But as you can see, we're getting into a much higher population of worms because this was fed, you know, much less or much more frequently than, than the part we were looking at a minute ago. Even so, this has been fed a couple of months ago and the worms are still working on all the little tidbits here on this. Also, you can tell the moisture is much higher in this uh, intermediate portion here. And as I find like big sticks and rinds of things that are not getting turned, you know, into castings very quickly, I move them to the far end. All right, let me move you over. Okay, now we're getting to the part that has been the most recently fed. Um, but you can tell that they've been right there on the top making beautiful castings underneath that cover. So after being gone about a month, uh, you know, I'm sure there's not going to be a whole lot of worm ball here for us to be excited about. But as you can see, the density of the worms is much higher here at the end where all the most recent food has been left. I'll put a picture up there of what we fed last time and you can see what the little worms were working on before I left for vacation. So per the wedge method I am going through here and or per my wedge, wedge method I'm going to take all the food that is in process here and I will keep mounding it up to make room for the next feeding. So I'm continuously flipping things over and making more room for new feeding and more bedding. So we've got some avocado pits here. They take about six months to a year to break down, depending. They, they, they break down a lot faster. Oh look, we do have a worm ball. Sweet, check it out. I did try to give them enough food. I mean, there's a lot of worms in here. There's probably 15 pounds of worms in here. So I tried to really load them up so that they would still have food uh, while I was gone. And it looks like they found a good, a good place here for them to snuggle in and have enough food to get through. So that's good. I'm, I'm glad that they didn't go without uh, their siblings or their I don't know, adopted relatives, the African night crawlers weren't so lucky. They ate all their food while I was gone. So I'm still, still flipping through here, still finding worm balls. So I can actually see some food. This looks like a lime. So I feed pretty much anything that if I would eat it, the worms will eat it. Uh, with the exception of the bedding, I'm not so much with eating paper. Um, I'm still finding worm balls. Check it out. So that's good. Most of the worms have vacated that end down there and they have moved on over here. That's that's great. A lot of times, especially during the winter time, I don't get this good of migration because it's, it's basically a continuous migration. They're continuously migrating out of the old stuff and into the new. And uh, so with me being gone for an extended amount of time, they really did get a chance to do a good job migrating. So let's get the far, far end here and flip it over. Everything stayed a good moisture in the basement. It is almost 70% moisture in the basement, which is, is nice because the, the worms don't have to worry about all the moisture evaporating on them and, and them having that problem like they did upstairs. All right, so still finding a little bit of food. So that's not bad at all. So everything went really well for Blue while I was gone. 
knowing that it's such a big bin, I did try to buffer, you know, and give it a lot, a lot of food, knowing I would be gone for a couple of weeks. So that plan worked well. In the future, I think I will need to set the African night crawlers up a little bit more uh, similar to what I've done here with the with blue. All right. Well, let's get blue some food. Okay. First things first. Let's get a a good layer of bedding here, and then we're gonna give them some food. So I've got some spaghetti, some melon. This has all been frozen, and so that should go pretty nice. Let me get some metting for the top of that as well. Okay, that will keep the bugs from wanting to uh, get on any of that food. I'm gonna cover up the the last part with a little bit of bedding too because some of that food wasn't completely gone. All right. Well, if you have any questions about blue or this system, go ahead and put those in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a muddy thumbs up. If you're not a member of my worm family, click that subscribe button. And if you want to know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that bell icon. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody have a good day.